Switzerland, a quaint and historic country located in the heart of Middle Europe and the Swiss Alps. Known the world over for its excellent watches, cheese, and army knives, and in 1958 Walt Disney is in town on a recurring trip, this time overseeing the production of his studio's current live-action film, Third Man on the Mountain. The 1959 film was set in the heyday of alpinism, a time in the late 1850s and 60s when mountaineering and exploring new heights within the Swiss Alps particularly was extremely popular. It was during this period that several of these tall mountain summits were ascended by a magnificent view and officially conquered for the first time. The plot of the film saw a young man attempted to climb the great mountain his father before him could not. Just like with Disneyland, Walt often pursued projects that truly interested him. Things like mountain climbing and dangerous adventures into uncharted territories fit the bill for sure, but the location of the story in Switzerland alone made the enterprise worthwhile for Walt. The film was being shot in Zermatt, a popular tourist town that Walt had been to himself a handful of times before, mostly for skiing vacations and things of that sort. There was just something about Switzerland, and Zermatt specifically, that Walt was attracted by. Perhaps it was the culture, the people, or the cuisine, but it just may have been its perfect proximity to the Matterhorn Mountain. The Matterhorn stands nearly 15,000 feet tall and boasts one of the highest peaks in all of Europe. Walt was in awe every time he glanced up towards it. He was filled with wonder and appreciation, if only for its grand magnitude and the fantastic spirit of adventure it represented. But maybe something more was brewing in his mind. One afternoon, Walt found himself in a local Zermatt shop where he surely could have bought souvenir knickknacks, possibly some Swiss chocolate or even a sweater, but no, something else immediately grabbed his attention. There, right before him, was a rack of postcards, one of which was prominently displaying a perfect vision of the Matterhorn Mountain. A mood of inspiration instantly struck. Without much thinking, Walt swiped it up and immediately began scrawling out a message on the back. He was addressing it to an art director and architect on his studio staff, Vic Green, all the way back in California. It simply said, Vic, build this, Walt. He licked a stamp and with a thoughtful push let it fall amidst the slew of other postcards and envelopes gathering at the bottom of the post office box. And that was that. Walt Disney was going to build a mountain. Well, if I had it to do over again, uh, I think, uh, no, I don't think it would. <laughs> I don't know. I hope I don't have to do it over again. <laughs> The year is 1959 and the Pacific Islands of Hawaii have officially become the 50th state in the Union. Charlton Heston as Ben-Hur races to the top of box office records, while folks at home are getting lost in a brand new dimension called the Twilight Zone. In addition, Walt Disney's long-anticipated 16th animated feature film Sleeping Beauty would at last be released to the public, and Disneyland is about to see its biggest expansion yet. Tomorrowland, as it was in 1959, was beginning to lack the original enchantment it had had from its opening day vision. Even after just four years of operation, the future was catching up in Tomorrowland, and Walt had a keen interest in addressing the fledgling land. Disneyland at this time would have welcomed its 15th million guests through the gates, and many of them were finding less and less to do in Tomorrowland. Walt needed to do something to keep up the shine and luster in his sparkling vision of the world to come, and in response we have Disneyland accomplishing its first true overhaul, as the Tomorrowland of the past truly began to take shape as the Tomorrowland we know today. There would be great change and growth in Tomorrowland, not only would it see minor additions like adding some length to the Autopia tracks and opening attractions like the motorboat cruise, which was basically Autopia on the water, they added something more. Three mammoth projects, three distinct modes of transportation, three unmistakably Disney and now surely quintessential Disney attractions. The submarine voyage, the Disneyland monorail, and the Matterhorn bobsleds were all to be opened in the summer of 1959. With Walt's towering ambitions, he saw an equally soaring mountain in front of him. Not only did he have a physical mountain to build, but he also had a subjective mountain to climb as far as planning, design, and construction were still needing to be figured out. He had a mountain to build and overcome, and just like Disneyland itself, he surely couldn't do it by himself. 
Walt Disney had a lot of skills and talents on his own. But perhaps his greatest strength was his special ability to identify and surround himself with creative minds and the right teams of people that could help him achieve his fantastical visions. Whether they offer their expertise in visual ways, colors, and physical models, or sometimes in mechanical ways, talented people with the understandings of the inner workings of machinery and construction. These types of people were extremely valuable to Walt and he called this group he assembled his Imagineers. Imagineer or Imagineering is the fusion of the words imagination and engineering. These would be the people who would engineer the magic, the ones that could turn that magic into a reality. Many of the original Imagineers had their roots in filmmaking, whether it be within Walt's own animation department or perhaps the set dressers or designers for his live action movies. No matter the background, you can see the influence of these original Disneyland Imagineers all around the park. For instance, you can see the work of Imagineer Claude Coates, a former background artist in the cutouts and figures of Mr. Toad's Wild Ride. The turrets and colors of the Sleeping Beauty Castle that we know today would not be the same without the original model work done by former prop painter Harriet Burns. We can thank former Disney art director Herb Ryman for pulling the emotional visions Walt had of a main street and a jungle cruise and even the whole of Disneyland itself by turning them into tangible and workable concept drawings. Imagineers first began to convene and construct in 1952 in a large warehouse building known then as WED Enterprises, the WED standing for Walter Elias Disney. Today this building is still there and is known as Walt Disney Imagineering, and it's where all of the research, design, and development of your favorite and even your future favorite attractions are happening. These early Imagineers were all key figures in the foundation and continuation of an initial Disneyland and the park would not and could not have been the same without their creative inclusion. The special visions Walt had for the expansion of Tomorrowland could not have happened without the expert inclusion of one Imagineer named Bob Gurr. Bob Gurr was an industrial designer who was first hired by the Disney Company in 1954 to oversee the construction and design of the Autopia cars. But this was only the beginning for Gurr. If you consider all of the varying transportation available in the park, you can safely assume Bob Gurr has had his hands in all of it. He's often quoted as saying, If it has wheels and moves at Disneyland, I probably designed it. Looking forward towards the upcoming expansion, Bob Gurr was going to be busy as he was tasked with overseeing and creating the brand new ride systems needed for each of the upcoming attractions. The first of which was the Submarine Voyage. In 1959, Walt could send his Disneyland guests to the moon and beyond the outer reaches of outer space. He could send them on flying elephants, soaring pirate ships, and colorful skyway gondolas and more. It was undeniable that Walt Disney had certainly conquered the sky. But there was one realm that he could not yet send his guests into. And that was the sea. Liquid space. On the submarine voyage, guests would climb down into a seemingly real-life submarine where they would take a seat on a bench before their own personal viewing porthole where they could take in all the amazing sights of the deep sea. Things like shipwrecks, mermaids, and sunken treasure were passing by, even glimpses of the lost city of Atlantis and gigantic, crazy-eyed sea serpents. Of course, these weren't genuine submarines, but they sure looked convincing on the outside. They were a collection of eight aluminum vessels and were even promoted to the public as the world's largest peacetime submarine fleet. Each sub could seat nearly 40 guests at a time and even though they had failed to do the one thing that actual submarines do, submerge, through visual effects, impressive sound design, and narration, guests were nevertheless excited to experience the eight-minute aquatic adventure. Bob Gurr was tasked with the challenge of designing the mechanisms required to give movement to the submarines as they went about their long journey within the beautiful waters of the 9 million gallon submarine lagoon, while not disrupting the sets or the illusion of being fully submerged underwater. The attraction opened on June 14, 1959 and was a truly incomparable experience that you couldn't find anywhere else. A week later, the rest of the Tomorrowland expansion was officially unveiled. While on a vacation trip in Germany, Walt encountered something that would change his ideas of modern transportation forever. It was an elevated train that would transit its patrons over and around the German countryside called the Allweg Monorail. Walt was immediately enamored and he wanted one for Disneyland. Before his trip in Germany was complete, he had already met with its nearby creators and manufacturers about possible plans for the future. When Walt returned, he immediately began throwing the idea around Imagineering. Trains were a vital part of the Disneyland landscape, and now Walt saw an opportunity to add one to the sky. Monorails were something that had existed to an extent beforehand, but Disneyland's models were going to be unique. They would be progressive looking and forward thinking. 
Bob Gurr was leading this project as well, tasked with adapting the current Alweg design with more efficiency and almost above anything else, a sleeker, more futuristic look that would match its Tomorrowland setting. Bob Gurr would improve upon the initial model, add some visionary flair of his own, and end up with something far removed from the original Alweg style. Gurr's design even allowed the track to be obscured when passing by. Gurr experienced a lot of trial and error during the creation of the monorail system. In fact, it wasn't until the night before the scheduled rededication of Tomorrowland that the monorail completed its first ever loop without breaking down. The completion of the monorail was so last minute that rather than train the team of hired monorail drivers as initially planned, they made Bob Gurr a uniform and had him drive in and operate it during the televised press presentation. When Vice President Richard Nixon and his family were on hand for the ceremonial ribbon cutting, Walt quickly took them on the first official ride, much to the chagrin and concern of his Secret Service staff very reluctantly left behind. The monorail on day one consisted of three cars with interior front-facing seating that could accommodate up to 82 guests at a time. The track originally was less than a mile long and basically just did a trip around Tomorrowland. The track has been expanded with track and stops and the cars have been adapted, remodeled and replaced several times since then. The monorail was more than just another Disneyland attraction to Walt, it was an answer to the dream apparent in the Tomorrowland dedication speech. It was the answer to the predictive hope of things to come, and you can see the influence that the monorail had on his own impending plans for a technologically revolutionary community of the future. Opening on the same day was the Matterhorn bobsleds. The original concept Walt had in mind would have had the mountain be an actual snow-covered peak with icy powder and everything. This idea quickly proved to be much more challenging logistically and practically, especially in Southern California, but the idea for Disney's mountain attraction was the same. As construction began, the elevated peak of the Matterhorn slowly started forming, becoming one of the most definitive aspects of the Disneyland skyline. On a space that was once a giant dirt heap and then a gently used picnic area known as Holiday Hill, a mountain was being created. With the help of miniature models and skilled Imagineering artists, a new landmark was rising over Disneyland. The mountain, of course, was only the housing for the entertaining thrills found inside. The Matterhorn bobsleds was the first ride system of its kind. Roller coasters before 1959 were generally built from wood and had a notoriety for being extremely jarring and jerky. This new ride system would be unlike any of that. Bob Gurr was tasked with designing the brand new bobsled vehicles as well as its brand new and contemporary track. The attraction offered innovation in a variety of ways, one of which being that the bobsleds were the first tubular and continuous steel track roller coaster in existence. This tracking allows for higher speeds, more rapid inclines, and better drops and turns. In doing this, Gurr and Walt developed the first true thrill ride and it immediately gained its reputation as one of the most exciting things to do in all of Disneyland. The bobsleds operate on two separate tracks and lift hills and careen and intertwine with one another at various points during the momentum propelled journey down. While both sides seem to jerk along at breakneck speeds, at their highest velocities the bobsleds don't go much more than about 18 miles an hour. Some of the best views in Disneyland can be seen from the top of the mountain, but only for a quick and speedy glimpse as you sled down the mountain. The ride caps off with a swift skim on the surface of a small mountain lake. This not only serves as a fun splashdown finale to the attraction, but also it doubles as a braking and a cooling mechanism for each of the sleds as they spray right through. The mountain itself is the tallest structure in all of Disneyland at 147 feet, making it 1 100th the size of the actual Matterhorn Mountain in Switzerland. Force Perspective, a tool used effectively on Main Street USA and other areas of the park, is on full display here, making the mountain appear even taller than that. With the addition of these three exciting attractions, Disneyland knew that each was potentially better than anything they were already offering, and they knew demand would be high. This led to the creation of the e-ticket. With an e-ticket, guests could get access to Disneyland's latest and most popular rides. All three of 1959's debut attractions opened up as e-ticket attractions. The term e-ticket instantly became synonymous with a guarantee for a tremendous and thrilling experience. If 1959 tells a story, its chapters would certainly include bits about these brand new settings of mountains and the deep sea. It would have notable callbacks to the chapters we had already read before, previous scenes in a town of the Old West, the air above Never Never Land, and the adventurous sights along the populated banks of the Jungle River Cruise. Varied and lovable characters like Mickey Mouse, Sleeping Beauty, and Davy Crockett would abound in every single episode. 
While the enduring themes of adventure, frontier, fantasy, the heyday of yesteryear, and the future of tomorrow would never lose their focus. It's a wonderful tale, and it's one that can be read over and over. In our enjoyment of these exploits, we must pay special homage to their authors, the creators, and the magic makers behind the scenes. Disneyland in 1959 is a story written by Walt Disney and illustrated by the Imagineers, and particularly Bob Gurr. If you can believe it, Bob had never built a submarine or a bobsled or a monorail before, but he had within him a vision, a creative expertise, a Walt Disney-inspired ideal that resulted in some of the greatest adventures and experiences ever chronicled. But this was only the beginning of the book. It's been said that Disneyland only opened in 1955, but that it truly didn't begin until 1959. The introduction was complete, and Disneyland officially was. And while many celebrated the park for these new improvements in theme park attractions and entertainment, who could have ever known what kind of progress, innovations, and wonder Disneyland would find in the upcoming decade? What a huge year for Disneyland. But remember, there was a lot more on the way. So if you want to see the awesome sauce that comes next, make sure you stay tuned to us here on Happy Place Explorers. And did you like that part when people thought Matterhorn wasn't jarring and jerky? Yeah. What a time. You know the drill. Like and subscribe, hit the links, and we'll see you next time in the Happy Place. Bye.